I'm a Pommy, this is a podcast, welcome to the show. Uh, just a quick one, we are at the London Hotel in Paddington, or the London Pub in Paddington, uh, and this is going to be our new home for the future, so all of our podcasts, well most of our podcasts can going to be based here. Um, just a quick plug for them, 4 till 7, happy hour, $8 on all schooners, 4pm till 7pm, so come check it out. Today on the show we have Mr. Simon Liu from House Finder. Simon, how you doing mate? You good? Good, thanks for having me. Oh, good. So let's start with a bit of a background, yeah. Hong Kong. Hong Kong, that's where, where I was started. born, yeah, 100%. Um, you know, 85, I only stayed there for four years. Uh, that's when uh, my parents, actually my mum and I and my brother came to Australia. Um, we came because we anticipated what was, what was going to happen to Hong Kong in 97, <coughs> you mm-hmm. know, which was uh, changing from uh, uh, British uh, colony back to, back to China. So we thought there were going to be ramifications and all that kind of stuff. So um, we came here, my dad stayed in Hong Kong while, uh, while he worked and we just kind of stayed here and went to school and all that kind of stuff. Was there, was, there like a, was there a lot of people in Hong Kong that were thinking the same thing? Because we've seen it recently on the news a little bit. Yeah, About yeah. tensions and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, the riots, and, riots and, stuff. and stuff. But I think so, it? yeah, definitely. You know, I, the, the two main sort of destinations back then was like either Australia or Canada mm-hmm. uh, for anyone looking to like escape or, mm. you know, have like a plan B. Um, but we chose Australia and, you know, in hindsight, great decision. Good so, decision, mate. <laughs> yeah, decision, good decision. Yeah. Hundred percent. But look, we we never grew up. You know, it'd be unfair to my parents to say that we grew up. Uh, uh, you know, poor. Yeah. You know, but we did go go without a lot of things, and the, I think probably the most challenging thing, just in hindsight, was the fact that, you know, my mom spoke no English. You know, she was here alone with two, you know, little boys, me and my brother, and mm-hmm. you know. Um, didn't know where to look for a house, didn't know how to drive, didn't yeah. have any sort of social networks whatsoever. Um, and I think that's, that's probably like created a, a bit of an impression on me earlier on that's led me to kind of where I am today. Just seeing that, I wouldn't say financial struggle, but definitely emotional and mental and, you know, the challenges that come with that as well. So, so, uh, so yeah, we came so in 89. Was your dad sort of working in his role back in Hong Kong yeah. and then sort of sending money over? Did yeah. your mum go to work here? What was no, the sort she of, didn't. She's just I mean, looking after you guys? Yeah, I mean, you know, two little boys and, you know, I, I suppose she didn't have the time or any idea on how to get a job. <clears throat> yeah. You know, Australia back in 89 was a very different place. Mm. You know, I would say it wasn't as uh, diverse, diverse yeah. as it is now. Um, yeah, so, you know, you go through the standard stuff of being a foreigner in a place where... There's not very many foreigners, especially where we lived. Um, so it was uh, it was more just looking after us. Yeah, our dad worked in Hong Kong and they uh, he'd send it over money and maybe come to Australia twice a year Yeah, just to, you know, obviously spend time with the family and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, those those were the early days. So <coughs> were you, so your mum didn't speak English, but no. did you guys speak English at the time? No, not at no. all, man, no, not at all. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I was four years old. My brother was uh, eight. Mm. So we just went to school, you know, pretty much immediately, kindergarten. It's a funny story, actually. My, 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 my name is actually called Sai Man Lu. Mm-hmm. Like, if you translate it directly from Chinese. Yeah, yeah. So I went to kindergarten and, uh, you know, the teacher must have found it challenging to pronounce Sai Man Lu for some odd reason. <laughs> so she decided to start calling me Simon. Yeah. And that's when it actually changed. Uh, uh, on my passport yeah. uh, to become Simon. And, uh, you know, it became a problem because every time I wanted to go back to Hong Kong, you know, I'd have Simon on the, on, on the, like the ticket and everything. Mm. And then when you go through customs, it's called, it's Simon. Yeah. So I was, I was, there was a lot of issues like traveling in and out of the country and all that kind of stuff, all because there was a bit of, uh, you know, casual, casual early nineties racism, <laughs> <laughs> just completely. Just casual Aussie. Or yeah, exactly. Hong Kong racism. Completely, <clears throat> uh, completely changed the name of a person. That, yeah, that's it, fine. It's <laughs> bad, isn't it? Because everyone, everyone that I know here that's that's Asian, and they're, they're sort of like second generation now. Their parents have moved over. Yeah. Um, didn't speak the language or whatever, and they've all got Western names now. Yeah. They like changed their like yeah, first yeah. name to like you know, 
uh, my office is mainly Asian, and yeah. it's like there's Janes in there. Yeah. Lee. Yeah. It's yeah. like <laughs> no, you did not. You were not called Lee or Jane yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. in the office. You were. Yeah. It was something more, way more complex. Uh, uh. Look, I get it. You know, it's easier to pronounce and everything. Um, but it should be done by choice. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. So, so when did your when did your dad? Did he, did he eventually come over to Australia? Yeah, but he, he came here when I was kind of like, um, I think maybe 16 or 15 years old, so much later in mm. life, right? Um, but that was when he retired or was close to retiring. <coughs> Kudos to them. Yeah, and he, he came back and, uh, you know, my dad can't keep still, so he came here and got a job and, yeah. you know, and then we became like a normal family, so yeah, to speak. Yeah. Um, but now prior to that, it was just really just me and my mum and my brother, um, you know, went through a lot of... Uh, uh, like I said, I wouldn't say struggle or anything, but definitely, definitely challenges. You know, well, it's adjust, up. adjusting to a new country. Yeah. And the way that they operate and language barrier. Language barriers. Start. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's funny. My my missus, she came over from Iran. Right. Uh, when she was nine. Yeah. And it was a similar thing. Like, and and she was very smart in school. Mm. And then coming here totally new language mm. and you're almost because there's a language difference it's mm-hmm. completely bottom of the pecking order again yeah right bullying and all that type of stuff yeah through school and things yeah, like yeah. that but it's funny because now australia is basically built on immigrants well it is it's but always what, been what is an australian well don't we don't know depends what, if you vote what? yes or no I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the, the upcoming yeah. thing but it, yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah it's just funny when i hear someone they're like i'm australian i'm like oh, what does that mean like, yeah yeah like, all oh, my parents are Polish and my dad's from blah 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 and I'm yeah. like well okay is that, okay what's Australian then um, so what was school like for you like uh, um, did you was it one of those things that you excelled in look school was interesting uh, for me I in hindsight I hated school you yeah. know from the very first day to you know the very last day in high school you know it was something that I didn't do very well in mm. you know I think that's probably the first uh <laughs> Um, because of my, my background, like, you know, my mum coming here with, you know, just both me and my brother, I think my mum had, um, hopes and dreams that we would, you know, obviously have a really good future and do well in school and all that kind of stuff. My brother did very well in school, yeah, but then I didn't. So, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't say I, I kind of thought myself was like a failure or anything throughout, throughout school, but, you know, I knew that I wasn't very good at it and... You know, I was interested in other things, you know, yeah. at the time, as we all do when yeah. we're growing up. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I didn't, you know, didn't get good grades or anything like that. I, I actually, um, you know, throughout kindergarten and all the way up to high school, you know, just kind of, uh, yeah, went along with it. Didn't do too well. Didn't do super badly either, but, yeah, didn't. Uh, yeah, I think that speaks to me a little bit. I just basically, <clears throat> I actually tried a little bit. Yeah. school like I was like oh god I'm gonna have to get good grades but then as the, the older I got the more I realized that it wasn't necessarily about grades yeah it was more about who's more hard working and I thought well I, I definitely can outwork most yeah. of these people yeah uh, I know they can read books and pass exams but mm. I reckon I can outwork a lot of these people yeah um, I mean in hindsight <laughs> I think like you know when you're in high school in particular you I mean you you, you cram 12 subjects you know, into your brain, you don't really care about whether you're learning or not, to be honest, just to pass the exam. Uh, and when I look back at why I thought myself as not doing too well in school is because I'm a very goal driven person. Yeah. And there's no goals in high school unless you really want to be like a astronaut or a doctor or something. Yeah. You know, you've got a real passion for it and you need these grades to get there. Yeah. But most people, when they do well in high school, you know, they get their commerce degrees or, you know, arts degree or whatever degree just to go with the flow because that's kind of like the natural order of progression Mm. um but i I struggled because i just wasn't interested in it you know i remember when i did my my high school exam uh to get into uni you're supposed to answer so you know all across uh uh, sydney people would read different books depending on what school you went to and uh you were supposed to choose Uh, a question, an essay question based on the book you read throughout the entire year and that you studied and you did all these mock exams and all this kind of stuff on. And I chose the wrong bloody question (laughs) because I didn't even read the book that I was supposed to read. But I managed to write like a, you know, three-page exam on it anyway, just made up some massive fluff thing. 
So that was an example of how not engaged I was, yeah, you yeah. know, in high school. But um, but other than that, yeah, it was just uh, it was a bit of a struggle, and um, you know, failed <laughs> high school twice um, actually because when I failed the first time, I um, had no direction. You know, I was a I was kind of all my mates were you know going to high, uh, to university and did doing their degrees and stuff, and I didn't have the grades to do it. So, you know, I had two choices: was basically to uh, go find a job mm-hmm. or go back to school. So back then, I didn't really want to get a job because I was still living at home. Yeah. Um, so you know, my mom kind of made me go back to uh, this place called TAFE, uh, which is like a secondary uh, education <coughs> yep. institution type thing. Uh, and they did they do HSC courses, and the HSC course was interesting because you get such a mix of people that go there. You get like ex criminals, <coughs> you get people in their sixties that kind of like you know left education till the very end, and you meet it's a, such a mixed bag. You meet yeah. all these different sorts of people, and that was probably a a, a bit of a. Um, uh, like a, a lesson, like perhaps socially as well, that there's like, you know, around the world, there's all these different types of people in Australia, there's successful people, there's people, you know, that are least, success, least, least successful um, from different sort of classes as well, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So, you know, I think that that was probably a better lesson than the educational component. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I failed that again, because like I said, very goal driven, I, I had no goals even doing it the second time around. Uh, and uh, that's when I was forced to get a job. Yeah, I think I think for a lot of people, it's just like I'm not sure what I want to do, so I'm going to go to college. Yeah. Um, and actually, really, you should only go to college if you know what you want to do at the end of it. Yeah. So, like, if you're if you've got if you want to become a carpenter, mm. go to carpentry school. Yeah. But a lot of people just join college because they're like, oh, well, this is the next thing that I'm supposed to do. Yeah. With no real sort of like understanding of. Drive what or, well, yeah what yeah. am I doing next yeah um, I was actually quite lucky when I got to college I there was a <coughs> a course called uniform services mm-hmm. which is basically anyone that wanted to join the fire service the ambulance service um, army navy whatever yeah um, and <coughs> it was known as a bit of a DOS course mm-hmm. like people would just do it to just bridge the gap for a couple of years yeah. like I get paid they, you get paid to go not paid to go there but it's paid for to go there yeah. um, <coughs> and I found this course in Cambridge back home and it was basically ran by ex-military guys mm-hmm. and I was like this is probably the only course that interests me but when I actually got on the course I was the only one that had an interest Right. so everyone else was doing it as a DOS and right. I was the only there was me and maybe one or two other people that wanted to actually join the police or the army or whatever it was afterwards. So I actually excelled and did really well in it. But it was it was one of those things I remember just getting to that stage in my life and thinking, I'm only actually going to do something yeah. if there's a job role at the end of it. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I'm just I might as well just go and fuck, fucking work at Macca's yeah. and work my way up. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. And at one point, I was like, I'm, I'm going to go and work at this. There was a there was a supermarket called Waitrose, mm-hmm. and it's a bit like um, Woolies, mm. you know, a bit higher end than Coles. Mm-hmm. And I was like, maybe maybe I could become a manager here. Mm. <laughs> that know, was a goal. That and earn a hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> That'd be really cool. Yeah. Because <laughs> I didn't have a fucking clue what I was going to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> Some, something practical. You know, I'm into my fitness, something practical. Maybe I should just join one of the government sectors, which is what I went and did after that. But yeah, right. so so after that, what what sort of job did you fall into, or did you sort of pursue? Well, you know, again at that point, you kind of got to um, you got two paths in life. Really, you can become a you know an apprentice to become a plumber or electrician and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> which, knowing their day rate now, isn't a bad thing. It's not a bad. It wasn't. It probably <coughs> wouldn't have been a bad thing. But I'm fucking rubbish with my hands <laughs> you know i can't nail a, 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 a nail to a to, to anything really so and it wasn't just like it, to me it was because back then I, honestly i had no direction yeah. i didn't know what i was going to do i was working a few part-time jobs like you know selling ice cream and all that kind of stuff so without wanting to do something with my hands i was thinking okay the only thing you can do like the only office <clears> job <throat> you can do when you have zero qualifications is sales yeah right so when i went out and bought a cheap suit because that's all you can afford when you first start yeah um and apply for a bunch of sales jobs <clears> and <throat> the only thing you can the the, the lowest of the, the the lowest sales job you can do in my opinion is recruitment 
Yeah. So that was the first thing that it's I did. It's the easiest entry level. It's the right? easiest entry level. <clears throat> it's probably the, the 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 type of sales role where there's such a massive turnover because it's not an easy sales thing to do. Yeah. Right? So because you're calling employers trying to, you know, see if you need to place people and all that kind of stuff. So I joined a recruitment company and I just got on the phones and, you know, made a hundred phone calls a day or whatever it was and cold calls and this and that um, and failed at that, obviously. I mean, I did all right, but to the point where they made a few redundancies and I was one of them. Yeah. So I got out of that. Strategic and redundancy? Stri- maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. Actually, I don't care anymore. <laughs> okay, so yeah, exactly. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. But... Um, <laughs> You know, I was uh, made redundant, and then I did um, I did uh, uh, telemarketing for a while, uh, and then I sold conference tickets for a while. Yeah. Like there's you know all those conferences that you see, like government conferences and stuff. There's actually someone on the phone pitching all these government guys to yeah, try yeah, and yeah. get them to show up, go go to these conferences, and I actually did very good at that. Yeah. Because I met a, a sales manager at the time who, um, you know, really pushed me to to kind of, you know. I guess maybe harness the fact that I was a very goal-driven person and go, okay, cool, you know, we can set up a commission structure and all this kind of stuff so that you can achieve, um, uh, you know, different goals and different levels of income and this and that and you mm. can start to think about what you want to do with that money. Like, it was very motivating. I would I would have considered him a bit of a mentor at the time, for yep. sure. Yep. Um, so I did well at that. Um, I was quite uh, – I found myself to be quite good at sales. You know, I didn't really have the, the issue of – what most people have, uh, which is, you know, fear of being rejected and, you know, feeling uncomfortable, cold calling and mm. all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I made a bit of money. But, um, you know, at that point in my life, I was thinking, man, it was still a massive slog, right? You know, every day your KPR was 200 dials. Um, 200 dials yeah, a day? monitored. 200 dials, minimum three hours talk time as well. Jesus. So you can't, can't just call bloody call centres you know, and then hang up and that'll be, an, that'll be another dial. And your calls were recorded. So, you know, every, every week you'd sit down and do like a call review or whatever it is. It was very intense Sounds sales, like intense, intense sales. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, after a while, obviously that's very draining mm. and you think to yourself, how am I going to get out of this? You know, and that's when I kind of read up a, a few books about property investing and, you know, how people achieve passive income to, to, to get financial freedom and, quit their jobs and so on and yeah um yeah so I obviously went down that path you didn't so leaving that role you didn't get into property immediately after that did you no not at all so where so there was like this gap between obviously now you're we'll get on to how successful you are in property at the moment which is where a lot of people would like to get to maybe even a tenth of the level that you're at now but where you obviously you leave that role and then you find yourself placed where doing what, driven by what? Look, the, the, the only thing I was thinking of at the time was uh, quitting my job. Yeah. Right, because I, I needed to figure out a way to get myself enough income to replace the income I was on. It so was about 100 grand a year, maybe plus commissions and things like that. Mm. So I didn't have to go to uh, to the office. Yeah, you know that was my only goal. Yeah, and it's it, in hindsight, it was actually a very good goal because you're reminded every day why you want to achieve it. The fact that you have to wake up in the morning at six thirty, you know, put, put on your on. put on your cheap suit, go to the train <clears> station, catch the same train with the same bunch of strangers that you see every day. You see these guys more than you see your family sometimes, yeah, yeah. but you never speak to them, sit yeah. in the same seat, same carriage, go to the same job, miserable, mm. you know, have all that pressure during the whole day, doing all these calls and all that kind of stuff, go home, be tired and not have enough money to live, you know, yeah. properly. And I think every day was a reminder why I'm getting on the phones. Why am I, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this to, 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 to ultimately get myself to a point where I could stop it all. Um, so, you know, after reading up on different property strategies and, and uh, you know, how to get myself enough passive income to quit my job, that became the focus. So every morning I woke up wasn't necessary to go to work to make uh, money. It was really just so that I could buy another property. Yeah. So I could ultimately reach a point where I had enough properties that would give me enough rent to cover 
you know, my income at the time. So, you know, every, uh, yeah, you know, that became the motivation. I didn't even really care about making money at the job because as a mortgage broker, you know that it's more about getting the pay slips, yep. right? To show that you have an income so you can borrow more money. Borrow more money, yeah. Um, but over time, I developed a strategy where I was making so much more money just by buying the right types of properties over my sort of, you know, nine to five income. Mm. So I didn't really care about, you know, two grand a week or whatever I was getting in my day job, like, you know, after tax, because every property I bought was like making me 50, 100 grand instant equity. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that became a real motivation for me. So <clears throat> at that point, you're super motivated to get into property. Yeah. So what were you, were you, were you, did you have like a savings goal every month? Were you trying to hit a certain target? Because obviously the hardest part is getting that first, second and third property. Yeah. And then after that, it kind of like has like what we would call a snowball effect mm. where it kind of starts to work for itself, yeah. et cetera, if you've planned it correctly. Yeah. So getting that first property, what, what did you do? What mistakes did you make? Um, how so did it come mistakes. about? Yeah. So many mistakes. <laughs> we'll, we'll try and run through some of them. Um, <laughs> So, you know, the first deposit is always the hardest, you know, at the, at this time of recording to get into any property, you need anywhere between 50 to a hundred grand yeah. as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And I was never given any money from the bank of mum and dad, right? You know, as much as I'd like to say, oh, here's your first deposit to go buy a house that never happened for me. So, you know, I had to just, um, uh, just focus on, uh, on saving as much money as I could. So I lived like a tight ass. Uh, you know, um, and saved up that very first deposit to buy finally this crappy unit in a suburb called West Ride, which is out in Western Sydney. And the very first property I bought was the biggest mistake, you know, yeah. because when people buy property, it's, it's a very emotional thing, right? It's all about how they feel. It's all about whether they can see themselves living in it. Mm -hmm. It's all about whether it's walk to trains or... Um, you know, tick the lifestyle factor, I guess. Yeah. But when you're young, especially, you tend to rely on the people that are immediately around you. And a lot of them don't know shit about property. Yeah. That's the reality of it. So, you know, my parents, look, you know, no disrespect to them, but they're not property investors. Yeah. So they were giving me advice on what to buy and where to buy. And again, you know, things like open plan, living areas and north facing like that was the priority so i ended up buying this two bedroom unit in in west ride super old building um you know through those three level walk-ups that type of thing um and i also bought it because there was a first home buy scheme at the time which meant you'd get sixteen thousand dollars from the government and free stamp duty yeah and it was everything under six hundred thousand dollars in terms of purchase price that you'd be eligible for this first home buyers grant mm -hmm. So in hindsight now, lo and behold, everything under six hundred thousand dollars was inflated. Because everyone was to buy everyone it. was getting. I remember lining up to see some units. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I bought this unit, hugely negative cash flow. What that means is holding the property costed you hundreds of dollars a week, yep. right? And I was taking home what a thousand, two thousand dollars a week. So I thought to myself, how am I going to get enough properties to actually quit my job? If even just one property that I own is costing me all this money, yeah, especially when you're in a when you're in a uh, a when you're in a job role which isn't bringing in yeah quite a lot of money yeah, and you're negatively impacted by the fact that it's negatively geared yeah absolutely and, it, and, it, and it's costing you every single month yeah is counterproductive um, if your goal is to you know either quit your day job or certainly use some of that rental income to you know maintain your lifestyle or yeah. increase your lifestyle yeah um i think for me like when i'm talking to people and they're like you know they're on combined incomes that are quite low or they're on um individual salaries that are reasonable i'm always saying to them like why why would you want to buy this place when you're you're going to be negatively impacted by purchasing the property or in your own salary if you've got to continue working yeah you're you're basically spending out of your own salary which isn't a great deal of money and you're gonna have to pump into this mortgage yourself the answer to that question <laughs> is just purely emotions yeah you know 
I think a lot of people think that buying properties um, is, you know, a financial thing. Like as in like they're going to, it's going to make them a lot, a lot of money. But I think deep down, a lot of us buy properties as a, a point of pride as well. Mm. So they kind of want to tell their friends and family about the amazing property they've got on in uh, in Paddington yep. or you know in in the along the beaches or whatever. Mm. So they'll happily leverage up, borrow a ton of money to buy some unit, one bedroom unit in Bondi or something. Doesn't make sense financially, you know. Very little growth, this and that. Um, and then later on after a couple of years they realize they can't hold on to it yeah or uh you know it's not conducive to what they originally wanted to uh to achieve and uh and that's when i had the realization that okay cool you know if i was to go down this path of wealth creation and getting myself passive income to quit my job i can't buy keep buying these two bedroom units to make me and my family and other people feel better it's got to be a, it's a business decision you know it's about yeah, numbers so, yeah. it's about cash flow and that kind of stuff it's um it's funny because even when i'm i've re- you recently moved and yeah. i recently moved and we we both still rent yeah what we call rent vesting um but you'll meet your neighbors on the street mm. and they're like oh did you just did you just buy yeah it's like they're teeing you up for an answer they're like they want to yeah. find out if you're renting or if you own it yeah. You know, are you an owner or do you rent? Yeah. And there's kind of this thing, and I think a lot of people feel it as well when they say, oh, we're just renting. You know, like it's a negative thing. Yeah. And I think a lot of people need to like flip that on its head. It's like, I had a, I had a like, nice lady down the road. She's lived in our house for 40 years. You know, probably affordable, probably not a desired suburb when she got it. Now it's a super desirable suburb in the yeah. lower North Shore and... You know, it's a, still a standard house. She hasn't done anything to it. You know, she wouldn't be able to afford it on the salary that she's on doing whatever she is now. But, you know, she inherited it and, you know, good for her. She's got no mortgage on it and stuff like that. But the first thing she said to me was, are you renting? Mm. And I was like, yeah, I am actually. And she was like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> but you can see that there's a judgment in there, there immediately. Yeah, and I'm like, well, if you talk to me a little bit more, you'll understand that I have a portfolio of properties. Yeah. And that. Uh, why the fuck would I buy this property for 3.8 million? Yeah. Because it's overpriced. Yeah. The rent would be shitty on it as an investment property. Yeah. And like, I'd rather buy six houses yeah. elsewhere Absolutely. in another state, probably. Absolutely. Um, but I think there's this thing around <clears throat> ownership. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I genuinely believe that ownership is powerful. Like, when you. When you own stuff and it's yours, it's a very good feeling that you get when it's like, this is mine. Mm. Like I own this piece of land or I own this house or whatever. Or mm. I own the car or you know all, all those types of things. It's nice to have ownership. But I feel that, especially in Sydney, where it's, it's less affordable to buy property, it's very difficult to buy properties, especially in the desirable areas. Um, there, is that, there is that thing around, are we just renting? Yeah. It's a stigma. I 100% agree. Like, you know, even even us now, you know, ridiculously expensive property <laughs> that we're renting right now. Uh, you know, not neighbor, like, you know, we've got, I got young kids and we get, we get the other mums come and play and, you know, play dates and all that kind of stuff. And they'll come in and, oh, this is a really nice place. You just buy this. And, and obviously, no, we're, we're, we're renting. We don't say we're just renting. We're yeah, saying yeah. we're renting. Yeah, yeah. But I actually, you know, after, as you, as you kind of, you know, I guess accelerate in life and you meet different people. Obviously I'm, you know, the people around me now are, um, you know, typically pretty financially sort of wealthy individuals. And savvy. Savvy as well. <clears throat> Actually most people I've met that are super successful financially it still rent. Yeah. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily a financial thing either mm-hmm. at a certain point. Mm-hmm. I think it's a bit of a lifestyle thing as well. Because when you're at a certain level as well, you know, a lot of things can change in your life you know you need to be flexible you know with where, where you move to and you know what happens where business opportunities are this and that so if you're tied down with a property that you own it's much harder to move yeah so there's like like initially it was purely financial right yeah rent vesting um is obviously renting where you live and you know you uh you, you pump your money into investments that's going to make you lots of money and the goal for me when I first started rent vesting was to ultimately have enough money to buy my dream home. But then after I get to a point 
where I had the money to or the means to buy a dream home, you just think, why would you? Why would you? Why yeah. would I'll you? just keep buying more. <laughs> you know, like, you know, if you if you're renting at a very high level, let's say three four thousand dollars a week, right? That's pretty much as expensive as you can get in Sydney, unless you're renting some ridiculous place. Um, to buy the equivalent, you're looking at around ten mil. You know, ten which mil is, plus, which is obscene money. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you know <laughs> the numbers, right? Like it's ten mil if you got thirty percent down, and you need thirty percent, anything above five mil, you're suddenly. Um, even just thinking about borrowing power yeah. for a second on that, if you had 30% and you got to pay the stamp duty and all the other stuff on top of it, to be able to borrow $7 million yeah. at a bank, yeah. you've got to be getting pay slips 100%. or income yeah. that is like $2 million a year. Yeah, it's crazy. Like even the wealthiest CEOs in Sydney, mm. most of them won't be on a couple of million bucks won't be able a year. To, yeah. No way. But then the repayments alone, <clears throat> after you spent the three mil, plus your stamps, your stamp duty. So that's three and a half mil, let's say. You still have to pay at today's interest rates on a seven mil loan, what's that worth? Oh, mate, like 30, 40 grand a month. It's a lot. Right? It's a lot so even if you're paying two grand a week or three, let's say four grand a week, yeah. you're still paying less than half of what you would need to pay in interest alone. And a lot of people think, oh, just because you, you, know, you own the place or you sign the piece of paper to buy a property, you own it, you don't. The bank, bank owns it. it. Yeah. The bank becomes your <clears throat> landlord. So now you've got, and trust me when I say this, when you don't pay the bank, the repercussions are a lot worse than if you don't pay the human landlord, right? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a um, uh, illusion, I think, that a lot of people think. And look, it's a, it's an Australian dream. It's a dream for everyone to own their own home and create, you know, memories and all that kind of stuff. Especially if you have a family. But, you know, I don't think renting. Uh, takes away any of that yeah but only adds financially as well and i think like it depends state to state right mm. like when you're living in sydney it's one of the most expensive cities on the planet for buying property yeah um similar to like new york london singapore all those types of places um but you know i, I don't see like a major issue in it if you're buying maybe in perth because property prices are a quarter or a fifth of the price for the same sort of property yeah but it definitely makes sense for anyone living in the city of new south wales for sure or yeah. maybe melbourne's coming up like that now as well uh, pro possibly melbourne as well yeah um but let's sort of let's go into your strategy because a lot of the people will have seen the description on these videos and mm -hmm. we've seen the caption that we're gonna do to try and get loads of viewers yeah <laughs> um, and, uh, and they'll be wondering you know how the fuck did you do it um so you started off first property made a big mistake yeah um some people might have seen your other po podcasts yep. about the second property what you did with the granny flat yeah the so, second one yeah so yeah. the first the mistake for the first one was not enough cash flow yeah right just costed too much to hold on to the other small mistake for that first one was the fact that it was a unit. Yeah. So in Australia, you should never buy units, townhouses or villas as an investment because anywhere you look, houses will always outperform. Houses on its own land, right? Because houses... From a growth perspective. From a growth yeah. perspective. Yeah. You know, everyone <clears throat> wants houses at the end of the day. Um, land goes up in value, buildings go down in value over time. Mm -hmm. And houses, you can do whatever you want. You can renovate them. You can, um, uh, you know, add value and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, to counteract the first mistake that I made, um, I decided to buy a property where it gave me enough cash flow to offset the the crappy unit. Mm -hmm. So there I was saving money again. You know, two hundred phone calls, this and that <laughs> every day, just pumping it out. Um, and I finally had enough money to buy a, a, a really old crappy house out in Blacktown, which is Western Sydney. And back then, I think I bought it in 2010 or something. You know, it was one of those areas that had such a negative stigma, like because it was considered like a really rough, really, really sort of bad area. Um, that everyone thought I was crazy, you know, to buy a, a house in Blacktown, you know, especially if you grew up and live in Sydney. So... And I couldn't afford, like, even black in Blacktown, the nice houses. So I bought this really old rundown. It was made of what we call fibro, which is asbestos. Yep. The whole thing was fibro. Most of the houses in the UK are like that. Are they? Yeah. Oh, well, 70s and 80s. Maybe not, not sort such of. a bad thing then. Yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's not good, though. Yeah, not it's good. really bad. And yeah. 
you know, the guy that I bought it off used to be a pigeon racer. And he had this massive structure at the back that was all fibro that he used to keep pigeons at. And I didn't know <coughs> anything about asbestos at the time. I just thought granny flat. So I, I actually focused on this house to build a granny flat. That yep. was what I was looking for. So back then you could get a, and even still you can get a granny flat uh, built without council approval. Mm -hmm. You just need to tick certain boxes uh, and you can private certify it and it'll be a very easy process. So I was just looking for the right land size, for the right parameters. I needed the house to be at the front or close to the front of the property. I needed enough side access so that when I built the granny flat, whoever lived in the granny flat can just go Draw through the sides the bottom, and yeah. create well, a, like a little L-shaped block. Mm -hmm. Found this property, ticked all those boxes, completely ignored the fact that it was all asbestos. Um, really old sort of 50s type property. And uh, I bought it, uh, I, as soon as I bought it, that's when I found out it was made of fibro or asbestos and I Googled it and I freaked myself out for, for a I'm while. going to die. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I actually uh, spent a bit of time renovating the knocking front Knocking some stuff out and uh, yeah. breathing in some shit. Yeah, yeah exactly. Not and, um, you know, uh, and uh, it was a mistake because to remove the, the, to build the granny flat, I had to remove the structure in the back, that big pigeon thing. Mm. And then that's when I realized the cost to remove Asbestos is extremely expensive. Yeah, it's expensive. You get guys in hazmat suits yep. and everything rocking up. Um, and it completely blew the budget out because I had a budget of to buy it and then build the granny flat. Um, the cost to remove like a little shed that was fibro was like $18,000. It was yep. huge, right? So anyway, another mistake. I did it anyway. Just kept saving money, pumped it into this uh, crappy old house just to complete the project. Built the granny flat and... I was cash flow positive. So the goal was met. Uh, and I was cash flow positive to the tune of about $200, $300 a week. Yeah. So definitely offset the unit. Mm -hmm. So now I was like, from a cash flow perspective, I was, I was neutral. Yeah, yeah. But then the second mistake there was I overcapitalized, meaning this was before the Sydney boom. Um, the money that I spent buying the property and building the granny flat was more than what it was worth. Yeah. So when, when I went to revalue the property, it came back less than the money that I put in. So you couldn't release any money. Couldn't release any money, but not only that, it really fucked up my servicing yep. for the next one. Because banks don't like it. When no, you pay no. too much money for a property, they think you don't know what you're doing and they're not gonna lend you any more money. So the first <laughs> lesson was cash flow. The second lesson was overpaying or um, over leveraging. So that kind of led me to a path of focusing on a very specific type of property that got me to where I am today. And what age were you when you did this second one? Oh man, probably 27. So you're 27, like 26. you yeah. spent, college wasn't ideal, didn't do very well at that. Yeah. Then you go through this phase of like job to job to job, but yeah. sales related, so yep. like kind of on the right path. Yeah. And then you get the first property, make a big fat mistake, because mm -hmm. you're listening to too many people around you, not professionals that have done it before. Yeah. Then you do a bit more research, but overcapitalize, but yep. it kind of pays off in the end, but probably takes a bit too long and the bank doesn't revalue it at the Correct, price yeah. that you want it to be so that you can yep. renew it and do it again. Yeah. So now you've learned all those lessons. <clears throat> what's the sort of strategy that you that you sort of take on from there onwards and then how did you grow it quickly enough for it mm -hmm. to sort of get you to quit the job and then focus on it full time so the two lessons was cash flow and uh <coughs> getting instead of getting negative equity get instant equity yep right so the only way to get instant equity in anything really whether you're buying a house or a car or a phone is to pay less Buy what it's discount. worth yep. right you got to get a bargain and in the world of property i would say it's probably one of the hardest things to do because mm -hmm. you're basically finding a seller that's willing to sell their house for less than what uh, they know they can get if they yeah. were to sell it online and the whole marketing shebang and all that kind of stuff so you need a motivated seller a very motivated seller <laughs> distressed seller people getting divorces people going bankrupt deceased estates mortgagees at the time um, like that was the stuff that I started focusing a lot on, mm -hmm. right? Because I thought to myself, there's no way I can just keep doing, making the same mistakes and saving a deposit. It takes me like three years, two years to save mm -hmm. up a deposit to buy another house. So I focused a lot on these, uh, these types of properties. And, um, 
at the time I, I, I kind of focused my efforts into Brisbane because Sydney was cooking, right? There was like, you know, lines of people at auctions and, yep. you know, open homes. It was a very hot market. So, you know, I, I started to look in Brisbane and it was dead. The market was dead. I think that's a point, right, is when things become popular, it's too late. Yeah. So it's the same with stock market. Yeah. Same with the property market. Yeah. When there's too many people like talking about it or it's in the news too much or whatever, yeah. then it's it's over. Because the guys yeah. that knew had the knowledge before knew that when it starts to go like that, mm. that's when they start to reap the rewards because yeah. they're already on the market. Yeah. And it's like, this is all in demand now. My property is going up in value. That's right. When you're trying to get on, it's hard, that's yeah. like, that's... It's hard to convince yourself because <laughs> typically, especially if you're going on market, which is what most people do, they go on domain or realestate.com.au and they go mm -hmm. to the Saturday Open Homes and they compete with all the other mums and dads and first home buyers and you know investors and you know you end up paying over market value it's hard to justify because the way you value properties or anyone values properties is they look at past sales yeah right so if you're looking at a four bed two bath two garage house 600 square meter 15 year old property you compare that to all the 422 15 year old houses that have sold but if the market's moving so rapidly all you're thinking is oh shit i'm paying so much more money for this one than the one that sold the identical one that sold last month. Yeah. So it's very hard to uh, convince yourself to pay a ridiculous price for it in the hope and pray that it's going to go up in value because that's not a strategy, right? Yeah. We know property eventually will go up in value, but I think what's more important is to make money on the way in. Yeah, you got to you got to otherwise you got to wait too long. You got to wait. It's also <clears throat> risky, mm. you know. Shit happens in life to all of us and yep. you like if you need to sell the property, you don't want to sell at a loss. Right, if you sell it before it goes up in value. So the other benefit of getting a bargain is that you mitigate a lot of risk. Mm. Like technically, if you get something cheap enough, you can sell it the next day and make a bit of money. Yeah. Even if you don't make money, at least you won't lose money. So for me, that was super important because at that point, I thought I was kind of risk adverse as well. You know, burnt twice. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, not only do I need to make money immediately, if I needed to get out, then I could. So I focused on these, uh, there was a lot of mortgages at the time in Brisbane. And back then, uh, mortgagee sales didn't have to go through the rigmarole now of having to meet like a, a valuation or meeting certain criteria and they needed to be marketed online for so long and so on. For those that don't know what a mortgagee is, that's someone that basically can't meet their repayments. Yeah, correct. Their, the, bank's their, the bank's taken possession the of back, the property. And they're just trying to get their yeah, money back basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I went to these auctions. I, you know, a lot of the times I was the only bidder. So, you know, I was picking up these houses in, in Brisbane at the time, like they were complete dumps, honestly. Like, you know, if you thought black, if I thought Blacktown was bad, these were- Shitholes. Shitholes, <laughs> right? And, but I thought to myself, you know what? If, if Blacktown, because at the time, Blacktown was going crazy. Yeah. And the reason why I went crazy was because everyone that wanted to get into the better suburbs in Sydney were priced out. These yep. are your mums and dads, your professionals. And when you get priced out of an area, you immediately go to the next best thing. Yep. It's just human progression, I mm -hmm. guess. It's called urban sprawl. Um, and then I thought to myself, you know what? If I look at history, Brisbane always follows the Sydney boom. So I'm going to get into Brisbane early now. I'm going to get into these next in line suburbs because you can kind of tell geographically, let's say you're looking at suburb A and suburb B immediately next to it is priced extremely higher mm -hmm. than suburb A then you kind of tell yourself, okay, eventually the more expensive part is going to get overpriced yep. and people are going to start filtering into the cheap stuff. So I identified that, that part was called Logan and is still called Logan in Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, and I picked up these dumps like $230,000 for like three, four bedroom houses, right? But Ridiculously like, cheap. Could you build a house for that price nowadays? You can't build anything, even back then, yeah. you know, you wouldn't be able to get your bloody DA for that price. So if the rent, if the rental income made sense, buying at 230 grand is like. Phew. Yeah. And you know, I was buying these one after the other because I was buying them for about 10 to 20% below market. So if I was paying 230 for it, I would be able to strip about 70, 80 grand of equity almost immediately. And that 70, 80 grand became a deposit for the next house. So that's what I mean when I say initially, I wasn't working anymore for the, for my paycheck. It was really just to get my pay slip so I can pull out more equity and buy the next house. Yeah. So then I kept buying like, you know, two, three properties a year. That was all I could afford, like even stripping equity because um, 
I was earning a hundred grand and the bank saw me as yeah, the boring too power, crazy. Yeah, exa- yeah, yeah. Exactly. So <clears throat> I kept buying these houses one after the other, rent them out. They were amazing cash flow, right? So I'd buy a house for 230, would rent for 350, 400 a week, which is like seven, eight percent rental yields, mm-hmm. uh, which in the world of property is very positive cash flow. Yeah, it's good. So bought these houses, didn't cost me anything to hold on to. They're just in the background, rented, passive income, a bit of maintenance, some tenancy issues here and there, but just built the portfolio to, to uh, 12 properties in seven years, you know, from zero properties. And that's, um, you know, during that time as well, I actually sold the Blacktown house uh, because it went up heaps organically. So even though I made the mistake, yeah. like the property market in Sydney just saved me, I guess. Um, and when I sold that house, the profits that I got from it, I immediately paid off two of the ones I had in Brisbane. So with two houses paid off, that was about, I guess, a thousand dollars a so week basically of you passive like income. A hundred percent of the money that's coming yeah. in from rent was Just, all going into yeah, your pocket. Totally. Yeah. And I was still working at the time. So every thousand I was getting started going into the third property. Yeah. So I started paying that one off. So it just starts compounding and, you know, the more you own, the more you start paying off. And where when, where did you see, because I feel like a lot of people, that, that first three or four properties, even the second, second, third, fourth property is kind of like a quite a slow process. Yeah. And it's like, a it's like you've got to be so patient and you're like, is this working? Like, mm. am I, you know, when am I going to see the results from this? When did you, when did you, when did you reach that point where you were like, wow, this is, this is making some good money. Like. Definitely the first equity boom. <clears throat> mm-hmm. You know, when you pull out equity. Okay, so when you own any property, you really don't know if you've made money or not unless you either get equity or when you sell it. Yeah. Up until that point, really all you're doing is dealing with negative shit. And the negative shits are things like maintenance, tenancy problems, your family and friends and colleagues telling you you're nuts and you're buying all these crappy houses that aren't going to go up in value. Yep. Even experts, you mm-hmm. know, at the time I was hanging out with a lot of like people on online forums and stuff like that. And, you know, people with massive portfolios of properties are going, why are you buying this, these dumps in Logan, right? Yep. So you're kind of overcoming that. Mm-hmm. But as soon as I got my first equity pool that landed in the account, meaning I could log on and spend that money, I was like, all right, there's something here. Yeah, this is good. This makes sense now. Because I, if I just kept repeating this, I want to end up with, you know, 10, 12 properties. And when they grow in value, just like the Western Sydney Blacktown house did, I'm going to expose myself to that kind of growth times 10, right? So if one of my $230,000 houses goes up to just, I don't know, 400, which isn't difficult to do. No, it's not. Right? You know, times 10, that's a lot of power. I think that the times 10 thing is where people have got to look because mm. I remember getting, when I got my first property, still have it now, it's up for sale because obviously moved to Australia a couple of years ago and I, c- I can't release any money from it anymore. Yeah. It just, I need to sell my UK portfolio to fund my Australia portfolio just because the banks don't want to lend me any money over there. Mm. But when I, when I look at that first property that I bought, I managed to buy it 20% below the market value. Mm-hmm. I got on an interest only mortgage. The mortgages are different in the UK. You can have an interest only mortgage forever. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't care. Mm-hmm. My mortgage is 200 bucks. I'm making uh, the equivalent of $1,200. So I'm, I'm almost clearing $1,000 a month, right? right? Obviously, if, you know, in the UK, you've got boilers and things which can go wrong. And yep. there's obviously stuff that can go wrong. But on the whole, if you're good to your tenant and you keep the place in good upkeep and blah, 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 you know, it was it was positive cash flow, providing there were no issues, um, $1,000 a month. Yeah. Now, $1,000 sounds shit to a mm. lot of people. They're like, oh, well, why did I do all this effort for $1,000? Mm. Well, if you repeat that nine more times, yeah. it's $10,000. Yeah. Sounds a bit nicer now, doesn't it? Yeah. But I think it's just, for a lot of people, it's hard to get them over that hump yeah, the, it like, is, yeah. The second house, the third house. Oh, we're still only making this. We're only making this. But timesing it by 10 is really effective as a goal. Just compounds, yeah. Because 100%. you're like, well, now I'm making 10, 10 grand a month. Yeah. That, that covers all of my expenses, my rent. Yeah. Um, if I want to go on holiday, I've got enough money to go and do it. Yeah. Um, I could possibly, possibly quit my job if I wanted to or keep my job and just smash the process for another three or four years. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, where is your portfolio now sort of 
how many properties do you own? What what sort of what do you have in in the sense of debt on yeah. those properties? So right now mm. it's at twenty six properties, mm -hmm. and uh, the debt levels is less than twenty five percent. So most of it's just paid paid off, off or offset. Yep. Meaning you have enough cash sitting in the offset account to completely offset pay the no interest itself. on the mortgage yet. <clears throat> um, and that's bringing me uh, you know 700 odd thousand in passive income 700 odd thousand yeah a year um, <laughs> look it was uh, it was uh, look, I, 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 like I'm shocked as well whenever I uh, say that obviously but it must be like because you say that you always say that in a very humble way, which is what I love. But but like coming from where you've come from, right? Like didn't speak the language when you got here. Didn't do very well in school. Yeah. Um, college was a complete fucking clusterfuck. Yeah. Then you go through all these jobs, and now you've reached this point of I've just this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to do it. Be patient, keep repeating the process. And then you wake up one day and you're like, whoo, 700 grand a year. I would uh, say, after you've paid your mortgages and stuff, right? Is that right? Well, I mean, I've got or, very little mortgages. Yeah, there's you know, barely anything yeah, left. So it's, uh, you know, <clears throat> before tax and all that kind of uh, stuff. So look, I would say it's, it, it definitely wasn't an overnight thing. Yeah, You of know, course. it's not like you wake up and go, oh shit, I've got 700 grand of passive income. It's like the first, two or three properties is the hardest. You know, even now doing what I do and seeing how people grow their portfolios, getting past that stage of, you know, making those mistakes or getting past the negativity of the people around you and, you know, you're not really quite sure that it's going to work out, this and that. Um, that's where most people stop. If it was that easy, everybody would do it. Yeah, exactly, 100%. But then once you get past that and you get the strategy right, it becomes a process of just repeating it until you get to the point where you don't have to work. That was probably the turning point for me. So when I got to about 100 grand passive income, uh, about seven years after I bought my first house, that's when I could literally do anything. It's financial freedom, right? You can work, you can not work, you can you know, start a business, which is what I did. Um, you can work for charity, you can I don't know, become a monk or something in the Do whatever you like. Himalayas. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, you have. As, long, as long as you're not overspending, 100 grand a year yeah. is like, oh, this is, you know, if it's not going to negatively, like, <clears throat> at the end of the day, rent goes up. Mm. So, you, so as long as you bought in the right areas, you're never going to be in a situation where you're like, that 100 grand is then going to become 90 grand or 80 grand. Like, you, you're. Most people can live off 100 grand yeah. very easily, yeah. even in today's world, you know, unless yes. you're spending I would agree that. ravenously. Yeah. Um, and then at that point I started this business and I leveraged off the fact that I obviously, you know, got myself to a point to quit my day job. I became a uh, buyer's agent and started House Finder and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of people reach out and say, hey, Simon, I wanted, heard you on the podcast, heard you on the story or whatever. And then that's when I really started to accelerate. Not only did I buy more houses, but I started paying off a lot very quickly, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where I am today, you know, just kind of kept building. So I think like as well, <clears throat> it kind of comes naturally at that point. Yeah. And you becoming a buyer's agent is more a byproduct probably of people going, well, how did you do it, Simon? Yeah. And you're like, well, if you want to know my 10,000 hours of expertise, then you need to pay me a sum yeah, of yeah. money <laughs> to, to go and do it, right? Because yeah. if, if people are busy with their own careers or their own lives and their yeah. own family, that's fair enough. Um, but to to go to someone that has done it is a rare thing. Mm. Um, and you can talk to a lot of real estate agents, a lot of buyers agents, a lot of mortgage brokers, anyone involved in property, financial advisors, financial advisors that have got no fucking clue about their own finances, buyers agents that have never bought a property of their own mm. ever, real estate agents that arguably, you know, they, they don't have a portfolio, mm. they're, just, they're just sales guys wearing their three-piece suits. Um, and mortgage brokers that don't have an investor's mindset because yeah. they've never bought properties themselves or done it. They're just yeah. trying to sell you products. Mm. So I think like what what you've done is clever because you've gone and done it yourself and then you've gone and set up this successful company where it's like, well, if you'd like to do what I do uh, or like to follow the portfolio and the strategy, mm. like here's what I've done. 
yeah. in black and white. This is the figures that I make. This yeah. is how I buy my property. I can buy you guys' property as well. Yeah. I'm sure there's a fee involved, but fuck, if you want to go and learn it yourself, it will take you 10 years to go and do it mm. yourself as well. Um, how does the buyer's agency um, work? How does it um, benefit people? Um, and and do you kind of do the same strategy for every single individual that approaches you? Do you kind of follow your mm. blueprint essentially, or do you? How does it work? So, I mean, I became a buyer's agent largely because I wanted to build the business, but also because I became <coughs> addicted to finding these bargains, deals. these deals. The sales guy in you, sales guy. But the <coughs> journey to accumulate twelve properties was uh, similar to any sales job. You get rejected a lot. You yeah. know, you, uh, you knock on a lot of doors and out of a hundred doors you knock, you get one lead or you get one sale. Yeah. Similar to finding bargains. You analyze a hundred properties mm -hmm. and then one of them will be like, oh shit, sure. you know, I can get it for this price, really? So it got to a point where I, I literally couldn't buy any more houses, right? The banks just completely stopped lending me money at that point about $4 million worth of debt, four yeah. and a half million on a hundred grand is not, not some, I was at my limit. So the same thing, I've been running this business for eight, nine years now, and the same thing still applies. The most important thing um, a buyer's agent should be able to achieve is to find your property that you can't get yourself, right? If you can pick up the phone even a hundred times and, you know, rock up to a stat day open and, you know, in, uh, uh, um, you know, inspect the house and make your offer and get the offer accepted. There's, in my opinion, there's no value in paying anyone any fee to do no, it. No, you should just go and do it yourself. Just do it yourself, yeah. right? And then a lot of, you look, know, I've got nothing against <clears throat> competitors. I do know that the industry is, in my industry, it's growing, but it's not growing in necessarily the right way. Yep. What you're saying is true in the sense that there's a lot of people now that they're savvy on socials and they're very good to at marketing themselves, mm -hmm. but they actually don't know anything about property investing. Yeah. Got no experience at all. So, you know, they'll sell you on things like, I'm going to save you lots of time and I'm going to do it all for you. And I'm going to send you all these reports and data and trends to justify an area that it's going to grow in value. It's going to be the next hotspot, this mm -hmm. and that. And there is value in that. Don't get me wrong. But to be completely honest, once you have your processes in place and the right people in place, it doesn't take very it, it's not a lot for us in my business. Yeah. But the main thing is really your ability to find a good deal. Yeah. So that's what I feel is always the most important thing. You know, if someone pays me my fee and I give them back several times that fee in equity alone in six months, not only is my fee justified, but typically they come back for a few more. Yeah. And they'll invite a few friends as well, probably after they're done, maybe. Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is is what you said as well is so true. It's like whoever you speak to, um, whether it's property or finance or, you know, if you want to learn how to bake a cake, you know, you speak to the guy that's done it for 30 years. You don't speak to the guy that's read about it in a book, mm -hmm. right? So I think that having that real world experience, like the, I guess mostly because of the lessons that you learn or that guy has learned in building that portfolio is so invaluable because the buyer's agency relationship isn't just me finding your property and see you later. There's a lot of mentoring, there's a lot of educating, there's a lot of, you know, questions that you can ask. Taking you through the process. 100%. So <clears throat> I think that's like whoever people decide to work with, if they are going to go down a buyer's agency path, needs to know that those two things, right? First, work with a person that's achieved what you're looking to achieve. And the second thing is, ensuring that they're getting you deals that are way better than what you'd be able to find yourself. Yeah, it's like going to a fat nutritionist. Well, you wouldn't do it. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> you want to go, if, you, if you're going to go to a nutritionist, you want to go to someone that looks fit and healthy, not someone that's... Uh, yeah. That's, um, <laughs> good analogy, good analogy. Yeah. So but there's uh, no fat nutritionist <laughs> listening to this. Um, <laughs> just, just like, um, I suppose to wrap, to, to sort of wrap things up, um, we'll do another podcast later down the line, but we don't yeah. want to give all the secrets away. Yeah. Um, just to wrap things up, what, what are the what are the uh, you'd say the top um, three things that people need to if they if they're first time buyers yeah buyers or in first time investors yeah um, 
what are the key things that they need to look for and who are the key people that they need around them to, to sort of, I, don't know, take, I would say take them by and the far the most important person uh, is going to be a mortgage broker. Thank you. Very because much. I'm not just saying that because you're <clears throat> here and you're running the show, but um, <coughs> no, genuinely pa- speaking, paid him a few. Good for that one. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, no, but so genuinely, if I look back at my own property journey, like I, be- I went through so many brokers, and brokers, as anyone knows, you know, there's one around every corner, mm-hmm. right? There's always a guy that's a, a mortgage broker, whether it's at Aussie Home Loans or Rams. I don't know if Rams exist anymore, but yeah, they do. Yeah. You know, all those people, but. The truth of it is most brokers are, are, are rubbish. Like they'll get you a loan for the next deal. But if you genuinely need to build a large portfolio, you need someone that's going to structure it properly, use the right banks at the right time. If, you're, if your goal is to pull out equity from the house, like my strategy, you need to take advantage of certain um, lenders, certain lenders and also certain products yep. within the lenders. So CBA, as you know, you know, in some cases makes it very easy for people to pull out equity, yep. usually within a few months of buying only. Mm-hmm. So little things like that, nuances. But I think as you approach your, a point where servicing does get extremely difficult, mm-hmm. um, a good broker will be able to move things around, you know, get you into different banks at the time that's, you know, a little bit easier to, to service and this and that. And you really need someone that's investment focused to be able to yeah. do that for well, sure. Well, I, I literally was just, um, well, you guys both know that I was talking to someone just before we started the podcast, just gave them a congratulations call. Yeah. It took me <coughs> refinancing four properties and taking a little squidge from each property in order to have the amount in the mm. bank that they needed to get one more property. So their previous broker was like, this is too difficult, you can't do it. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm pretty sure we can give it a go and we mm. can see where the valuations come back and we can, um, you know, get get hopefully get the money that you want. Didn't promise it, but hopefully we can get the money that we want. We'll test the valuations at different lenders and then we'll, and we managed to release like 50 grand from nice. four properties. Yeah, wow. So we got the 200 grand that they needed. They then bought the the, the the property that they wanted to buy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to be fair, like they're leveraged now. They're, 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 they need to play that patient game now mm-hmm. um, where they need to wait for the market to do its natural thing mm-hmm. um, and, and, or, and or for the rent to increase so that they can get more servicing. But, you know, the ultimately they're, they're six properties in now and they're, they're, they're sort of 10 years away from retirement, so they're, yeah. getting, they're getting set for it. Um, but yeah, like you say, for some people, it's, they put it in the too hard basket and they're like, oh, well, mate, mate, yeah. we can't do this now. Yeah, no, if, um, you know, it's it's not about interest rates. It's not about like all the stuff that people focus on when they typically go get a loan. It really is how you pull that equity out. It's a very smart thing that you did that you pulled out a little bit of equity from each house to come up with a big chunk of money so they can keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, I think most brokers would probably just chuck that in the too hard basket, to be honest, because there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of so stuff that you paperwork. have to do, right? <laughs> so that's another reason why you do need a good broker and a good person, anything really. Yeah. But in property, if you can't borrow, if you can't get, you don't have the money, you can't buy, simple as that. So that's yeah. the very first step, yeah. I always say. And after that, who should they look to? I mean, like normally I sort of send them to financial advisor, accountant, possibly a buyer's agent. Yeah. Um, would you agree that they're the sort of the other three three professionals they probably need to talk to? Yeah. I mean, what we do is we kind of help people formulate a bit of a strategy. Yep. So it's not just like, hey, we need like your parameters per se to buy mm-hmm. a house. Mm-hmm. Um, we go, okay, cool. What's your goal? What's your situation? What are you looking to achieve? How, do you, how are we going to achieve that over a period of 12 months, two years, five years, 10 years? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, what type of properties we need to buy, obviously. So... Look, financial planners, I'm, I hope there's no financial planners listening, but I'm always a little bit iffy about uh, 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 financial planners that, especially ones that, like I said, using the cake baking analogy, if they haven't achieved true wealth or financial freedom or like, whatever you want to yeah, call it themselves. I would agree with that. <laughs> so how do you make your money? Well. Yeah, exactly. It's usually <laughs> from the commission on the product that they're going to recommend you. Exactly. Um, so I would just say, look, um, yeah, broker first. Uh, you know, even if you don't intend to use a buyer's agent, maybe speak to someone that's, uh, uh, you know, achieved what you're looking to achieve. So if your ultimate goal is to quit your own job, you know, uh, speak to someone like myself, maybe that's done it. Um, and 
yeah, just take it step by step and go from there. Simon, thank you very much. I'm no Apollo. This is a podcast. Catch you on the next one. Thanks for having me. <laughs>